Hi, my name is Kelsey Vanderbilt Ranyard. I'm a birth mom, and this is another episode of the Three Sides of Adoption. Um, we're joined by Sarah Easterly, adoptee, Lori Holden, adoptive mom, and we're so grateful to be joined by Tony Hines, transracial adoptee, author, and training specialist at Case in Maryland. Tony, thanks for joining us. We thanks are so, so much excited for to hear me. from you. Yeah, we're so excited to hear from you. Um, we're going to do this episode on the problematic behaviors of birth parents. So we've talked about the problematic behaviors of adoptive parents, but we would be remiss if we didn't talk about my side of the triad and constellation because we do have that title parent in our name and we do carry responsibility that comes with that. And often that's kind of a mystery on what that role really truly is and the harm that we can do if we don't recognize that role. So Tony, um, not to put you on the spot, but give us a little look into your story to kind of preface this conversation if you can. Sure, Kelsey, you know, thanks so much for asking. So my story starts before I was born, of course, when my mother uh, was, was pregnant with me. And I think that a lot of times we start adoptee stories from after the adoptee is adopted and sometimes from when the adoptee is in an orphanage. It's important to remember that that story is then it's really starting though before before that point in time because the mother and and the father in a lot of cases as well are making plans for what their child's life is going to look like moving forward and when i was born like many adoptees my parents plan went awry pretty quickly and they both realized that they weren't going to be able to care for me my birth mom is schizophrenic and so she realized that she was not going to be able on a day-to-day -day basis, I think, to take care of me. So what happened was she would really take me to my grandmother's house sometimes, and my grandmother would take care of me throughout the first year or so of my life. And in some of that first year of my life, my mother would also take care of me, but there were times which were really difficult for her, and she would realize, you know, I actually need to go to maybe an orphanage and place Tony there for a day or two or three days or four days. And I'm told that it was on one of those days that she placed me there that she was told either you need to leave Tony here in this orphanage or you need to take him home, but you can't keep doing this back and forth. And so that's when I was placed in an orphanage in Washington, D.C. on a more indefinite basis. And I stayed in the orphanage from when I was about the age of one to about the age of three years old. And it was at that time that Mary and Janet, my two moms, were matched with me and decided that they wanted to become my foster parents. And so they became my foster parents. And after spending a year or so with them, they knew that they wanted to adopt me. And so they started the proceedings to adopt me. And they adopted me when I was about five years old. And up until this point in time, is a pretty a normal, regular adoption-related story in that way, even though my family makeup was different than a lot of adoptive family. Two moms, two white women, two women who identify as LGBTQI+, and a Black child was rare at that particular point in time, but we were a family, we were an adoptive family, and we were moving forward in that vein until we found out about three months after that adoption, that that adoption was actually going to be and was overturned by a panel of three judges who decided that a same-sex white family wasn't the right household for a Black child. That decision was appealed by my moms all the way up to the Supreme Court, where they did not decide upon that decision. They knocked it down to the lower courts who decided upon a joint custody agreement between my birth family and my adoptive family, which really started this time in my life in which an open adoption was really in place, even though technically I wasn't adopted anymore. It functioned as an open adoption where I was growing up with my moms, with Mary and Janet, but also seeing my birth family every other week or so for a day. And sometimes I would also spend the nights there as well 
And my sister, my birth sister, sometimes would be there too because she grew up in the house of my grandmother. And so that's just a little bit about my my story in those first really seven years of my life, even. And seven years are, are a long time, but at the same time, it's still very young to have experienced the the breadth of things that I had already experienced. And you have to think about, you know, I'd already experienced things related to race relations, things related to discrimination of LGBTQ plus peoples, birth family connections at that young age. And so I was really thinking about all of these things, even though I wasn't able to verbalize exactly all of what I was feeling. And that's something that a lot of adoptees, I think, go through. So that's just a little bit on my story to, to start with. Thanks, Tony. That's, I had never heard your story. They uh, Sarah and Lori had mentioned she was, they listened to the podcast with, um, was it Angela? Is that, yeah, yes. okay. Um, and I had never heard it. So that's, that's fascinating. Um, so you had like a front row seat to both birth parent connection and adoptive parent connection. So I'm sure you had like a really um, keen eye. <laughs> for any problematic behaviors on both sides. Is that right or am I off base on that? No, definitely correct on that. You know, on the, I'll start with the adoptive parent side. On the adoptive parent side, I noticed that my mom's, sometimes their language was language that was not the best language to talk about my birth family. So for instance, after interactions with my birth family, my moms would always ask me the question, how was it at Miss Davis's house instead of, you know, how was it at your grandmother's house? And so I would kind of always say, oh, it was fine. It was this. It was that. And it wasn't really until I was 20 years old, I, I want to say, that there was an instance where I was at Easter or Thanksgiving with my grandmother and I came back and my mom asked me, how was Miss Davis's? And I said, mom, could you could you just call her grandma, you know, instead of Miss Davis, because that's who she is to me. And she said, oh, I didn't know that. And I said, well, yes, you know, this is something that I didn't know that was problematic for me, that it, it something always felt kind of off, but I didn't know exactly what language and verbiage I wanted to use in addressing what problem I had. And those were the types of things, the types of conversations sometimes that were had around birth family as it related to my mom, sometimes my mom's plural, not understanding the correct way to, to talk about them. I didn't always feel as though there were these positive thoughts about my birth family. I kind of felt as though they were um, waiting to, to hear some negative things maybe about my interaction at my birth grandmother's house. And, and so those were things that were problematic from, from that side of things a lot. I should also say my story has another wrinkle in it as well, because the woman that I grew up thinking was, was my birth grandmother. I found out this when I was in my teenage years. I found out that she actually was not and is not my birth grandmother, that she's actually my step great aunt, that she was a really good friend of um, my grandmother, my birth grandmother, that she was a family friend and that she called herself my grandmother, my birth grandmother, because she felt it would be easier to gain custody of me back then when the custody battle was going on, if she said that. But I didn't know that. And I grew up with her family at times and calling her grandma. And I still do that to this day. And so that's who she is to me. As, as we know, as adoptees, our families are, are our chosen families in that way. And so that was kind of some of the difficulty on that side of things. On the birth family side of things, and you'll continue to hear me reference grandmother as birth family as well. On the birth family side of things, when I went over to my grandmother's house, there were a lot of instances in which she really questioned the validity of Mary and Janet, my two moms as parents, where she would say, those white people don't know how to parent you. 
um, do you have any black friends? They're not going to know how to teach you what it means to be black. When I was older, there were questions about my sexuality, you know, and when I went over there, it was, do you have a girlfriend? And if I said no, the answer then was, well, do you have a boyfriend? And she would say this in front of, you know, the entire family. And I didn't feel supported by the rest of the family in those particular times to speak up and say, hey, you know, Tony, he doesn't need to hear that even. Um, that's not an appropriate thing to say to him. And, or beyond that would have been just because you're raised by two gay women doesn't mean that you're going to be gay yourself, obviously. My moms were raised by heterosexual parents and they're gay. And so obviously we know that that logic is, is flawed, but I definitely felt that there was a lot of tension between my adoptive family and my birth family. I didn't truly feel like either one of them made an extended effort to interact with each other. I definitely felt that they wanted me to know that it was safe to interact with both of them. My grandmother never said anything like, we're going to take you, you know, we're, we're going to keep you here or we're going to find a way to get you back. She never said that. And my adoptive moms always made sure that every second Saturday I was going to go to my grandmother's house and spend the entire day there and stay the night there as well. So both families really did what they could in those ways, but they were not openly communicative with each other about those things. Such a like unique situation especially for like going through the legal adoption process you know what I mean like I think that some kids get um, adopted informally and that may be the setup but to like do the formal although like because of the court giving you guys joint custody that's that's what makes it different but it is an interesting um setup and and it doesn't surprise me at all to hear that there was like tension because we see that now in formal adoption arrangements, um, unfortunately, because it leaves the child to play like, or feel like they're playing like tug of war and they're in the middle, <laughs> they're the rope. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, Sarah, Lori, <laughs> do anything to add? I just, uh, I just wanted to share the image that came to mind as you're explaining the dynamics um, that you had, Tony. Um, I see you as a wishbone and you know, your moms have their hands on one side of it and your grandma has her hand on the other side and they're careful not to break it, but there's no connection between the two of them. So while you have an open adoption, meaning you have contact, um, and they were both trying to do right by you. They didn't close the triad. They didn't have their own connection with each other. And so um, that, that must have been, I'm guessing that was a little bit hard for you to be in that precarious position. Definitely, definitely. And I do feel like that's an accurate way to describe it. And it's also informative for the families out there listening that just because you have an open adoption doesn't mean that there's open communication necessarily about the intersectionality of your child's experience as an adoptee. And it also doesn't mean that you are necessarily really putting your best foot forward to interact yourself with your child's birth family and vice versa, birth family with adoptive parents as well. And so in my situation, and this is a situation that a lot of adoptees go through, there was definitely at times a sense of dueling loyalties about which family should I be loyal to that? I know that I should be loyal to my birth family because they're my blood. And I know that, and this is back when I thought my grandmother was my blood, but even after that, that she still was willing to take me in knowing that she wasn't blood to me. And, and then of course, my adoptive parents as well, them being the parents that raised me, I didn't want to speak negatively really about either family. And I saw positives in both families, in both of my families. And for me, of course, they're, they're one family, but to them, they're two family. And to the outside world, I'm talking about two families, but to me, it's one family. And that's what adoptees are, are often going through and conceptualizing this thought process. And so for me, what ended up happening was 
after those interactions with my birth family where I would hear problematic things said about about my moms, about you know, gay people, about what it meant to be an adoptee. And then I would get asked the question, you know, how was it at Miss Davis's? I would shut down. I would just say, fine. Almost every single time I was asked that question, I said it was fine or it was good. How are they? How are they doing? Uh, Angie's good, my sister. Angie's good. She's fine. Um, Courtney, you know, her daughter is is fine as well, and everyone's fine. And that was, you know, the subdued nature in which I would approach that conversation. And when I was at my grandmother's house, I don't remember getting asked, you know, honestly, how is it living with Mary and Janet? It was the tone was more, how is it living with them? You know, assuming this negativity with it. So for that, I would also shut down as well. And I would say, it's good. It's fine. I like it. And so there wasn't an ability for me at that particular time to have my own voice to really say, this is how I feel about both, um, both of what you're doing in these instances. And this is why I feel it's problematic. And of course, I didn't have the language uh, when I was younger to be able to really say those things. And that's what adoptees are going through all the time when it comes to talking about birth family, when it comes to interacting with birth family. And there's, for me, there was, of course, a sense of, of guilt that I wasn't able to be raised by my birth mom, because I actually had a decision to make. They asked me during that custody battle, which family would you rather live with? Would you rather live with your adoptive family or would you rather live with your mom in tandem with your grandmother, perhaps raising you? And I said, I'd rather live with my adoptive family. And then I remember before that court date happened, I went to my grandmother's. I didn't see my birth mom very often growing up, but I would see her maybe once a year or so for the first 10, 11 years of my life. And this was one of those instances. And I remember being seven years old and my mom sitting me down and she said, Tony, would you rather live with, with them or with me? And I said, and I kind of looked down and I said, I'd rather, I would rather live with them. And I think I said it in that way, kind of stammering, pausing, unsure, but still sure at the same time. And I could see just on her face pretty immediately how painful me saying that was for her. And she started crying and looking down. And my grandmother was actually there during this time and was yelling at me and saying, you know, look what you've done to your mother during that particular interaction. And my mother was just kind of sitting there and, and saying that she understood and that she still loved me and that she in her way was still going to be caring for me. And I still remember that and I still value and hold that. So I feel as though as far as my birth mother goes, I do feel like she made the best effort that she could to talk positively about the man, the boy that I was and how proud she was of me. And that let me know that she was proud of the way that I was raised and was okay with me being raised by my adoptive family, even though I knew it was painful for her. So unlike other adoptees, I had the opportunity to know that, which a, a lot of adoptees don't know that because they're not able to have interactions with birth family, with birth parents. And so that is something that I was able to take comfort in, even whilst being in this kind of wishbone state as well as you mentioned there, Lori, too. Tony, that's really, really nice to hear, you know, you know, because we, um, yes, the title of this is problematic behaviors of birth parents, but that's a, that's a, that's a really wonderful behavior um, or not, I don't know, always like the word behavior, but just that's a wonderful um, kind of sense that, that she gave to you. Um, but my heart does break for young Tony, just all of that pressure that that was that decision was put on you and the weight of that that's um and just all the the loyalty divide that you mentioned um on a, someone who's seven years old i mean it just my heart breaks that's so young um and it reminds me hearing you talk reminds me of you know i think what what we commonly hear maybe this is partly because it was formally joint custody but um of how children of divorce can feel often when you have two parents who are kind of 
not fully trusting each other, not, um, not feeling great about the sharing, but doing it because they have to, and then kind of checking up on things. Um, but we also, it feels like we've come so, so far with, um, you know, teaching, you know, divorcing, divorced um, couples, how to interact in the child's best interest. And, um, you know, it sounds like, you know, I know we're talking about, you know, you're now an adult. <laughs> um, so this was in the past, but, um, you know, more training is needed for how to kind of take that model, perhaps, and apply it to um, these relationships between birth families and adoptive families, which is why we have these conversations. But um, I'd love to use that as a segue for you to talk about the work you do at CASE, because that's what you do professionally as well, right? Correct. Correct. And thank you for saying all of that, Sarah. And so I now, as really inspired by my own experiences, I am a training specialist at the Center for Adoption Support and Education, where I train adoptive parents, prospective parents, foster parents, professionals, including clinicians and social workers, and also judges on best practices in adoption, best practices in foster care around attachment, grief, loss, guilt, shame, birth family connection, interracial adoptive family placements, LGBTQ family placements as well. And so in my work, I kind of get to talk to parents about my own story, but also what I've learned from my own research about kind of the, the commonalities that exist in adoptee and foster youth stories as well that kind of undergird this sense of shared identity for us as, as individuals in these particular family types. And I also get to talk about some of the best practices for when your child is coming to you and maybe they're shutting down in the way that I was shutting down, or maybe they're acting out at school and you think it's just strictly a behavioral issue when it's really also related to the trauma that they've already experienced. And I also try to tell families that I think what happens a lot of times, adoptive families particularly think that they experienced all this trauma before they came to us. And now it's kind of us up to us to kind of just deal with it, help them process it and move forward. But there's still trauma that they're often experiencing after they're adopted. And sometimes that comes at the hands of adoptive family. Sometimes that comes at the hand of birth family or peers, other actors involved. And it's a really ongoing situation that requires ongoing solutions and constant communication about what it means to be adopted, what it means to be an interracial adoptee for a lot of our families. For kids like me that have two moms or two dads or an LGBT grade plus parent, what it means to be in that family type or what it means to have an adoptee that identifies as LGBTQ plus themselves. And I don't call on all or even most adoptees to go out there and be training specialists and educate because that's not our uh, responsibility. It's not our responsibility to, to educate parents. But in those instances like my own, where we feel just really um, called to do it in a sense, and that this is our passion, then I definitely encourage other adoptees out there to do that. And it's been something that, that I've been doing that's been really fruitful for me in, in my growth and um, and also just gives me opportunities to connect with other adoptees, with birth parents, with prospective parents. And so I'm 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 glad to to have had those experiences in that way. I was wondering as the um, adoptive parent here, I wanted to perhaps zoom out of just your your individual story and into more general terms of dynamics between adoptive parents and birth parents in an, in, in, who are having an ongoing situation of contact or relationship uh, and bring up some of the common things that I hear adoptive parents saying. And the ones I'm going to bring up are not from people who are looking for reasons to close the door. Um, I, I, I see online a lot of people who are really eager about trying to have an open adoption and they, they, um, 
they're curious, they try, and then it gets hard. So these are people who are not trying to close the door. These are people who are trying to keep the door open, but it gets hard. So um, I have two things. The first one is probably quick. Your name, did Tony was the your birth name and you kept that. How about Heinz? Is that, does, is, is that from your birth family or your adoptive family? Great question. Heinz is from my adoptive family. And I remember the occasion because I was at a pizza place with my moms and they asked me if I wanted to become a member of the family permanently. And I said, of course, isn't that what we are and what people do? And they laughed and said, yes. And then that's when the name came up and they said, would you be okay with taking the last name of Mary, Mary Hines, one of my adoptive moms, because she was the one that filed um, the adoption papers and was my adoptive parents. Janet was my legal guardian because they, at that time they thought it would be easier for a single person to adopt rather than two women trying to, two lesbian women trying to adopt. And so I said, sure, I, I'd be happy to take the, her last name. And that's my last name to this day is Tony Hines. My birth name is Tony Lee Jones. My mom's also changed. I was born actually Tony. Most Tonys are Anthony's um, formerly. I was actually just born Tony. My birth mom named me Tony. And my name was actually changed to Anthony Hines. And so that is my legal name. But Anthony never felt, I never took to Anthony. Even to this day, when people call me Anthony, it, it takes me a split second to turn around and, and to recognize it happened all the time in college as well. And so Tony is, is who I am. And that's part of my identity. That's part of what ties me to, to my birth mom. And even when it came to her giving me that name, it felt really unique in that way. And so I do talk to families about the importance of a name for adoptees and having conversations about whether they would like to um, keep their name or, or change it. I do not necessarily feel like they should be doing that. The name change should happen when they're still under the age of, say, seven or eight years old, because at those ages, they're just going to go with whatever the parents really um, are indicating that they want them to do, which is what I did. But I hear from parents of children now, adopted children now, that, well, we changed our son's name when he was six, but now he's 13, and he wants to change it back. And I want that for him. And so we're engaging in the process of, try of trying to change it back. And some kids want to stick with their names in those ways. And I think that's also a conversation then becomes a conversation between an open adoptions that birth parents and adoptive parents should also be discussing is even when it comes down to this naming, that is a huge piece of, of identity. And again, it's a huge piece of identity generally, but especially when it comes to a lot of interracial adoptions as well, when names are changed and international adoptions specifically too, when names are changed in those ways. And I know I realized in the course, this is a little bit off topic, but I realized in the course of this conversation, it's titled, you know, problematic birth parent uh, interactions. And you haven't really heard me talk about my birth father at all. And, I, and that's because I often just leave him out of these types of conversations because that is been to me a representation of his place in my life throughout my life course. And I do still feel that there are unresolved um, issues that I have with my father because unlike my mother, I didn't get to hear from my father as I was growing up. And I also know that in the case of my father, there was a particular court date. My grandmother and uh, the family were appealing the decision and someone had to come to the courthouse basically to make a claim on their behalf my grandmother was there. My mother was not able to show up that day. And for obvious reasons related to her mental health challenges, I was able to pretty easily forgive that. But apparently on this particular day, if he had just showed up, that would have shown the court a lot as it related to even maybe him gaining custody 
of me instead of my mom. But he didn't show up to court that day and they never really heard back from him. And he's just kind of been in the wind ever since. And so there, there's this really sense of, uh, in, we call it ambiguous loss. And it's these losses that adoptees really have questions about that are unresolved losses that we feel. And questions that I would have with my birth father would really be, why did you do what you did? Were you thinking about me? Did you care? But these are things that throughout my life I've kind of pushed down because it's just been, for, for me, um, I think anger has led me to feel as though, well, why do I need to think about you or talk about you if you're not doing the same for me in those ways? And I'm not going to sit here and say that that, that anger is, is dissipated or, or gone. And I don't think that um, even when we get on platforms like this, that it's healthy for us as adoptees to discuss our, our issues as, oh, I was going through this, but now I'm just in this great place in all areas and I'm just perfect because that's not genuine and that's not how life works for any of us, whether we're adopted or not. And I think that even though I knew that my mother suffers from schizophrenia, there were still some unresolved questions that I had of her as well around, you know, what do you know about my birth father? What can you tell me about him at least? Even if he's not in my life, I would like to know more. And I had a conversation with her, I want to say seven or eight years ago now. It was the first time we had spoken, I think, in about 15 years. And during the course of that conversation, she said to me, you know that when I was putting you in your crib, your birth father was when you were an infant, your birth father was almost always there. And he liked to sing you a particular story and read you a story as well. And I said, whoa, I, I had no idea that that was, that was the case. And here I was already in my 20s, thinking my entire time and my entire life that my birth father wasn't even present when I was an infant. And so those things are things that make, make you uh, think about these things in more complex terms. And in doing the work that I do, I understand that, especially throughout the life course of birth parents, that there are ebbs and flows that go on in relation to their feelings about wanting to be in the lives of, of their children. And oftentimes, as time continues to move on and on, they feel as though, well, I can't do it now because too much time has passed now and they'll hate me now. They will resent me now as well. And I think that that is in and of itself a logical um, situation, but also a, a problematic type of behavior as well that birth parents are often exhibiting because for an adoptee, especially in cases where there hasn't been abuse um, in that home, adoptees simply want to know more about birth family and whether they get to know more at 10 years from when they've interacted or 20 years or 30 years, they're still going to hold tight and really appreciate at least having more information. And so I would share for birth parents that it's really important to continue thinking about maybe even being active in writing letters to, to your adopted children that you never send or just thinking actively about questions that you have for them about how their lives were and things that you'd like to tell them. Doing some of these things spurs birth parents to really want to reconnect moving forward and to want to reach out again as well. So those are some of the things that I talk about in some of the trainings uh, that I have and when we talk about open adoption. I was just going to say, I'm really thankful that you brought up um, the birth fathers and it reminds me, um, I mean, I think that that is a, that's a common one, right? Because I think um, a lot of birth mothers um, may find themselves even pursuing adoption because of the dynamic with the birth mother and the birth father often. And I think that there's, even if that's not the case, there's often pain and I think just speaking of that divide between birth parents and adoptive parents, I think there can be a similar divide that the adoptee can pick up on between the birth mother and the birth father. And um, 
you know, even if it's just not even wanting to talk about that, it, it could be painful, it's, it's too painful to talk about. And then yet the adoptee has to sit with that and reconcile that. And that's really complex. So, um, and you're right, just the information is what we want to know. And um, those stories to, for you to get that story of your birth father singing the song to you, um, that's so meaningful. And, and you had to wait till you were 20. You should have, you know, in an idealized world, which we don't live in, but it would have been so nice, lovely to hear that all through your childhood and to carry that with you. Um, Lori, I'm sorry, I cut you off, but I just wanted to talk about that. And I wanted to quickly just say, I'm so glad you brought up names too. We did a whole episode on names. Um, and I feel like I want to just go plop you into that episode too, because you said so many terrific things about names, but yeah, so, so important to the adoptees. So Lori, back to you, because I know you, ha you had another question. There. Well, you, you actually covered some of the things I want. I wanted to thank you for, thank you, Tony, for bringing up birth fathers and also the naming and that strong connection to identity. And um, also how the naming process, especially with a domestic infant adoption that starts early, the way the two families come to that decision sets the stage for future interaction. So all of that is in that um, episode, Naming a Newborn. But I also wanted to table the, where I was going to go and, and head into another one that you've led us to about that adoptive parents try to deal with, which is the disappearing, uh, disappearing birth parent or somebody who's just not around. Um, and the, the, the different kind of loss that that is for the child and we're trying to help our child with their losses. So I know, Kelsey, you'll probably have some things to say about that, the disappearing birth mother, the not present birth father and all permutations of that. Yeah, I think, um... <laughs> I think as always, like as I always bring up, I feel like a broken record, but like when we talk about things like the disappearing birth mother, like you have to also in conjunction bring up the power dynamics of the relationship. I always have described my, and I have an open adoption. We talk frequently. I visit once a year now. I used to be more frequently, but I live far away now. But um, I have this like constant urge to just like run from the relationship. And so if you don't have the, I don't know if like discipline is the right word, but it's probably not. But if you don't, if you don't, or the self-awareness to know like, this is not a reflex that you should listen to. If you don't have that in your brain, then you're gonna listen to your gut and you're gonna go because it's so uncomfortable, especially in the beginning stages. It's so uncomfortable. You feel like such an outsider and you feel like you're not wanted, even if they could tell you, we love you, we want you here, X, Y, Z, but like, you just don't feel like you're supposed to be there. And, um, and you may have other people, I did have a few people in my life, not, not a ton, but a few people in my life that were like, you did what you were supposed to do, now it's time for you to move on. And it's like, well, that doesn't really work that way. But if you don't know that it doesn't really work that way, you're gonna go you're going to split the scene because it's so it's a heavy thing and you're re reopening the wound every time so if that's uncomfortable painful or just unbearable for you you're going to leave and I think that the the root of that problematic behavior totally begins with the professionals that are walking through this adoption process with this mom um, and so often now we're seeing that there's not a professional present at all, that there's a lot of like self-matching going on online. So there's no one that is um, knowledgeable that's really guiding her through this process and telling her, these are, this is, you know, um, what your, this is your decision, what you're choosing to do, but they're not telling her also, you have a responsibility in this. They're telling you, it's okay. You can just place this child and wipe your hands of it and move forward with your life and get a second chance and everything. And it's, that's not reality. And that's not a child-centered adoption. And so birth parents are ushered in to this process without education. And really like they, they're kind of kept in the dark this whole way through. And then they get to this open adoption and the adoptive parents are like, well, we don't understand why she, she left. She doesn't want to like no one ever told her that she has a hand in this too and 
no one ever told her to not listen to those reflexes telling her the fight or flight to go. So she's, she's going to do what her body's telling her to do. And that's what she's doing. So that's my piece on disappearing birth parents. I hope that's helpful. I don't know if it is, but I think it's important to like get to the root of why these behaviors exist, you know? Well, I completely agree with you. And I think that birth parents struggle with that gut reflex. But I also feel that adoptive parents and don't tell themselves the truth a lot of times and their gut reflexes, like you said, I don't want the birth parent here. This is my child. This birth parent is a threat to me as far as being able for me to see myself as their true and quote real parent. And we know how problematic that real totally. parent term is. And so adoptive parents though have been told, well, you should be in these open adoptions and you should be open about it, but they're not being told that those gut feelings that they have are natural feelings for them to have. And so you have two actors in the situation who are being counseled against even discussing or thinking about those gut feelings. And so you have the adoptive family who aren't being honest with themselves and who don't know that birth parents sometimes are feeling that way. And you have birth parents who are saying that this is really uncomfortable for me. This is a situation where I do feel like an outsider, no matter what you're telling me and where, where I do miss my child. And I realize every time that I see my child, perhaps how much time I've missed in their lives every single time that I see them as well. And that's not something that's, that's easy. And it's something that makes me want to retreat even more a bit to not have to interact and think about that. And these are our conversations that are really, like you said, important to have with birth parents during that pre-adoption stage and also with adoptive families as well. And I unfortunately have also heard from other birth parents who said the exact same thing that you just said, Kelsey, whereas it's, well, you know, you've placed them for adoption, you've done what you were supposed to do, and, you know, they've been called to adopt as well, and you should just kind of step back and, and be proud that they're being raised by whatever upstanding feel, family they feel is raising uh, your child in that way. And like you said, that's not how life works. When we have children, especially for mothers, we are physiologically connected to that child. It's chemistry. It's our bodies literally making connections and attachments to our children in those ways. And so it's not easy, of course. It's very difficult to be separated generally. And also to be told that you should feel okay about that is just completely opposite of what nature and nurture has really guided us to to be in practice in those ways too and and i also think it's why we continue to focus on birth mothers as well and why birth fathers are left out because we know that mothers are the ones carrying children we know that mothers are often the ones that are staying and making those adoption plans while fathers are often not in the picture when it comes to these types of situations. And so it becomes easier to forget about birth father and those types of interactions. An adoptive family, it becomes easy for them to forget about birth father as well. And to, as you're saying, not to value how difficult it is for birth mothers who are doing this by themselves a lot of times, right? Like they're flying across the country by themselves to see a family of five that is treating them a certain way. And adoptive families aren't thinking about that. They're not thinking about, well, they don't have their partner perhaps supporting them and helping them. And they don't have somebody to support them when they get back to, to their homes either after those interactions as well. And adoptees, for, for us, it's feelings of rejection if we're not able to see birth parents as much as we were before and feeling as though, well, why don't they want to see me as much anymore? Or feeling, well, maybe my adoptive family wants to keep me from seeing them, or maybe my birth family, that they don't love me as much as I thought, or maybe I did something wrong to upset my birth family. And so that's why it's important, really, 
as you're saying, for the Adoption Kinship Network to be having these conversations amongst each other, all members having these conversations so we can begin to understand each other a bit better. And if I could just sum up what I heard both you and Kelsey say in, uh, is that even if we have contact, if we don't have an actual relationship between the two sets of parents, then um, the, a door has two settings, open or closed. So if, I've always known that adoptive parents, if it gets hard, they close the door. Kelsey, it was the first time that I thought that birth parents may be going through that too. When it gets hard, you just want to close the door. But if you have the ties together, not through the child or because of the child, but if you actually have a relationship with the other parents, maybe those are the binds that can, that can keep it from being an open door or a closed door. When we were prepping for the show, we were brainstorming just um, some of the things, and maybe Lori, this is better for you to speak to, just some of the things that we tend to hear adoptive parents pointing to as problematic. Um, social media sharing, uh, sharing pictures of the child on social media, um, new, you know, coming with, coming with a new boyfriend every time to visits, um, um, I, I, showing up for visits high. I'm, you know, I, these are hard things to talk about, but I'm just wondering, you know, we were just kind of try, trying to come up with a list. There's probably more, I'm sure, but what, um, what are your thoughts there? I mean, I think part of what we're talking about, you know, I, I, I consider myself a developmentalist, not a behaviorist. So that's why even just the title of what, what our topics are, give me a little bit of pause. Uh, prickly feeling talking about behaviors because I can see now, you know, having this conversation does explain a lot of that. It kind of, you can see the developmental reasons of why any, any boyfriend, any person will do to come to these visits just to have a support person. Um, any, you know, you know, sometimes addictions are there for a reason and we, they're coping, right? It's a coping for, for really deep pain. Um, you know, anyway, I, I, I don't know about what would explain the social media sharing other than just maybe wanting to feel like um, some ownership when maybe there isn't as much ownership in the family. So um, I don't, I'm not sure what my question is there. I just thought it might be helpful if we just ban, you know, banter and throw that one out there a little bit from our different perspectives, Tony, yours in particular. <laughs> well, all of, you know, our perspectives throughout this conversation have been really valuable for me to hear and those are great points and I definitely feel as though like you said a parent who's suffering from addiction is often self-medicating and in those moments that are high wire moments for them those are moments that they're more prone to fall in or back into their addictions and so it's not surprising then as you're saying that they're showing up high to visits, if we think about it from that perspective. It's not surprising, as you said, that they're showing up with new partners um, who are serving as support systems for themselves. And I think for birth parents, it's really difficult to realize that your role as a parent, the expectations that you had are so much different now than reality, and that you had visions of before you birthed a child or before uh, uh, the other birth parent was thinking of parenting a child, taking that child to, to class recitals and to af other after school events. And now you have realized that that is not your story. And so with social media, with sharing, as you said, you're able to, at least for a moment in time, reclaim that ownership and to reclaim that parent role because one of the things that parents do is share their kids on social media, right? You share your kids every thing that they do, it seems like they get shared, whether it's sometimes just in the grocery store or being um, out with friends or interacting and doing something funny at dinner. These are things that parents really like to share to show the world that this is their child and their child is bringing them a sense of joy. That's no different for birth parents. Birth parents, even though they're not actively raising their children, perhaps in some cases, that doesn't mean that they're still not feeling those feelings and wanting to share out. And so what I often 
see as well, though, is kind of because of that, not having a proper really understanding of boundaries that need to be set. Because what happens during those times with the oversharing is that sometimes that sends the wrong message to adoptees. Sometimes the adoptee thinks, well, if my parent is sharing about me, then it's only a matter of time until they take me back. It's only a matter of time till I get to live with them again. And these are, of course, ways that adoptees are processing and the language that they're using oftentimes in thinking about this. And sometimes birth parents, another problematic behavior that happens is sometimes birth parents overpromise things. Sometimes they say, I'm going to see you in a month or I can't wait till we can be a family again because they're just so enamored in those interactions with their child, understandably, that they want to let their child know that their wishes and the wishes of the birth parent maybe will also come true. But it's not proper boundary setting that is going on there, either internally within themselves and also externally with adoptees and with the adoptive family there. So a lot of what I see is birth parents showing up sometimes as you said, unannounced in certain instances and dysregulating children because of that. And then I also see adoptive parents pulling away, sometimes perhaps before they should and giving up on birth parents, just because you haven't heard from a birth parent in four or five months and you've sent them several texts, it doesn't mean that they have, quote, given up on seeing their child as well. And again, as, as Lori and as we've all really talked about that's why it's important not only in open adoptions have communication about logistics as far as when the child is going to see their families but how we're feeling about the entire process and how we're feeling on an ongoing basis about it because open adoptions sometimes they can be more open where we're having in-person visits and play dates and things of that nature and sometimes it can just mean information sharing related to photos. And a lot of times, in a lot of open adoptions, we're seeing in one family, both of those things and more of those things coming in to play. Open adoption is really about you know, ebb, and, ebb and flow and navigating the ebb and flow of those relationships. And if you think about it, that's really what we do in plenty of our relationships in life, really function as this ebb and flow type of um, relationship. And that's how we also need to be thinking about adoption and open adoptions. Kelsey, maybe you'll have something to say about that. And I, I want to make sure we get into this episode because adaptive parents will want to know this question um, or this issue. Um, and I can fit it all under one big umbrella, which is undermining when birth parents somehow undermine the adoptive parents and some of the things you brought up, Sarah, fall under that. Um, so using social media, if you've been asked not to, as long as other family members are also in the same roles, um, using a different name than what's been decided. Um, uh, maybe not obeying rules about showing up with, you know, smoke, smoking, serving sodas if we don't serve sodas, just, just undermining is kind of the the thing that I hear a lot. Yeah, I think that the undermining thing, um, yeah, it happens on both sides too. And I think that it's like, uh, it plays into the possessiveness that either side may feel. Um, and it and plays up the insecurities and stuff like that. But I think that it, when you look at those kind of behaviors, it's not a child-centered adoption. You're veering, you're centering yourself, you're centering, you know, your need to be mom. I think it, it was a hard thing. I remember right after placement, I like, it hit me like a few weeks in and I was like, oh my God, he's never, I'm never going to be his mom and he's never going to call me mom. Now, that may not, may or may not be true. I don't know, but, but um, acting on those hurt feelings and acting on those insecurities in front of my child or in the relationship um, is centering myself. And I think that those behaviors can all kind of be traced back to centering yourself instead of your child. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, and I would also say that um, one of the mantras I always use in, in my own podcast is do your own work, people. So I think that's what you're saying for birth parents, perhaps, to take a look within before you start to you know, try to control what's out there. But I think that's even more true for adoptive parents. To we, we need to do our self-check about our insecurities, our control issues, and make it more child-centered and do our own work. Because we're the ones who got to parent. We are the ones who, at that point in time, had it together enough to do that. So we, we, I think we really need to rise to that over and over again. Yeah, for sure. Um... Yeah, so I think have we covered every problematic <laughs> behavior of birth parents? Probably not. Um, but I do think that we've definitely um, hit on some really important topics. And I think one of the most important things that we've done is trace the behavior because you you can't really um, attempt to tackle some of some of this hard stuff unless you are really knowing where it's coming from and so I think that's one of the most important and if and if we haven't hit on a certain behavior that any listeners were hoping to hear about maybe we have at least given you the tools and the, um, the know-how to trace that behavior back to the root and and get to work on any of that so any anything else I think I like what you just said, Kelsey, and I would say it's, you know, all both these episodes, problematic behaviors of adoptive parents and problematic behaviors of birth parents is not to make anybody wrong and to shame anyone. It's to understand and then it's to get back to the centering for of the adoptee and how it affects adoptees uh, mental health uh, for the, and their, the stories that, uh, that they're telling themselves um, that they're throughout, as they age throughout their lifetime, uh, thinking of how they're going to, you know, when Tony and Sarah <laughs> adoptees or, um, you know, grow up, uh, how is this going to, how are they going to dial this back and, and look back on, Oh, you know, these things that felt like I, I loved how you worded that, Tony, because I can relate to that so much and just so many aspects of adoption. You just you're not sure you don't have the language, you don't have the understanding, the, the consciousness, but something's off. And then, you know, you hit your 20s, your 30s, your 40s, you know, every year and you're filling things in more and getting more understanding. And, and so um, just it's it's all part of this conversation is all part of that long game. Uh, just thinking of how, you know, thinking ahead now so that it's um, well thought through for the lifetime of the adoptee. Tony, thank you so much for joining us today. It was like really amazing to talk to you. So, Thank you all so much for having me. I learned a lot and I love that you're doing these topics. Thank you. <laughs>